long time no see. I missed you guys. I've been super MIA and I've been missing making videos so much, but I have been doing my dissertation, which has taken so much out of me. <laughs> I also had two other quite long essays. So it was just like the end of year stuff was so much. And I did a lot of reading for uni, but I'm back. <laughs> so I thought today I would give you guys a March and April wrap up just to get back in the swing of things. So this is just what I've been reading lately. Okay, I'm gonna go into some stats real quick. So I completed 15 books, DNF'd four books. This is over the whole two months. I read one translated book. I read four books by BIPOC author, four books by BIPOC authors. I read from four male authors and 11 female authors. In terms of where I got the books, I got 12 from the library. I read two that I own, and then I read one on KU. So I read from a variety of different places and authors, and I'm really actually happy with like the amount I've read. I think I was constantly really frustrated over these past two months that I was having to do so much for uni that almost the last thing I would want to do after a day of working on essays is go and read. So I was like, I thought I barely read it all these last two months, but I've read 15 books, which I'm happy about. I usually read about 11 or 12 books a month, but I did the best I could. Oh, and also I submitted my diss two days ago and now I'm officially done with uni, which is insane but yeah now time to look for jobs but i'm giving myself a little bit of time off i'm just really excited first i'm going to quickly go through the books that i dnf and some of these made me really really sad <laughs> actually specifically this first one trust the emerald sea okay this is so sad but it's not forever i think i just wasn't in the right place i was tabbing it like i was liking it but i wasn't loving it the way that I wanted to and I think it all just came down to mood like I was struggling with this book I got almost all the way through it like I think I had 100 pages or something left at the end like you know that feeling when you you want to go read but then you're thinking about the book you have you're reading right now and you're like oh I just don't really want to that was kind of how I felt reading this like every time I forced myself to sit down I ended up enjoying it when I was reading it but I was not invested in the way that I want to be or the way that I think I will be when I read this at a better time for me so really sad but it's it's not forever okay the second book I DNF'd was called The Witches Salem 1692 and I picked this up on audio because I've been listening to Girl Historians which if you haven't listened to it you should check it out I don't know if you know Carly Thorne she does YouTube and Blair McMillan. They're both Canadian comedians, Canadian comedians. And they basically have a podcast where they talk about history. So the first season was about Titanic and I loved it. And then this season's about the Salem Witch Trials. And I think that they mentioned that they had read this book like as part of their research. So I put a hold on it on Libby and I got it. And I was like, I was listening to it and it was told in a little bit of a confusing way. And then also, I just kind of knew the information already from listening to the podcast. So it was just like my intrigue for it was really low. So I didn't keep up with that one. I think I DNF'd it at around 30%. The next one, like, I don't even... <sighs> so I've been really low on money lately. And I have decided to look into websites that will pay me to read, like pay me for reviews. I found one website that I was going to go with at first and they gave me this book which is actually just on KU called The Magician's Secret by Charles Townsend and I just it, I DNF'd at 9% and then I just like quit the website I was like I can't it was a book that was already out and like has been out since last year so I was sort of like I don't know why we need more reviews for it but it just everything about it was bad it's a very stereotypical fantasy book Sorry about my creaky chair. You know how it is if you've been around this channel. So it was just like this guy, he's a magician or he's like a magician's apprentice and his friend that's an actual magician dies. He gets blamed for it and is almost hung because this evil guy comes in and chants everyone. And this is all within like 15 pages. Like it's a lot. The writing was bad and like, I just couldn't, 
do it. So I didn't. Then the other one I'm really sad that I DNF'd is Just Kids by Patti Smith, which I DNF'd at 35%. It wasn't that I didn't like it. It was that I was in a really rough place mentally. And then I was reading this book and she goes through some really hard times. This is Patti Smith's memoir about when she and Robert Maplethorpe Mapplethorpe? Maplethorpe? Anyway, they were living together in New York and they would be homeless sometimes and it just at times is really dark and it was really well done and something I'm definitely gonna go back to as well but I just was like not in the mood. So now we can actually get into the books that I finished. First off, for my dissertation, I'll just go through these ones quickly because I have read them both recently. I wrote on Mayfly by CJ Lead and Boy Parts by Eliza Clark. So I reread both of these and like heavily annotated them so that I could really pull out specific quotes and make sure I was like really doing a deep analysis of the books. If you don't know what these are about, this is Boy Parts. It's about this girl that lives in Newcastle. Her name's Irina. She sucks. She's horrible. Like she's an erotic photographer and she basically just pulls men off the streets and like scouts them. And she loves taking photos of either men who are like super average looking or kind of like weak, like twinks. <laughs> she loves a twink. And she has these impulses that are not always great and she might have killed someone. So there's that. And then, oh, Mayfly. I love this book so much. It's probably gonna be one of, if not the best books of 2024 for me. I think I've read this in January and I'm still obsessed. It's about Mayfly, the title, what is it? The eponymous character. She is a serial killer that lives in LA, works at Disneyland as Elsa, like she plays Elsa at Disneyland. Let it go. Basically, she really is afraid of losing the people that she loves. So she's afraid of losing her job at Disneyland because that's really important to her. She loves it there. She's afraid of her friend Kate, making it big in Hollywood because she's a struggling actress. And then she's afraid of her grandmother Tallulah, who's actually in a coma for the whole book, dying and like leaving her. So she is panicked because she knows that her, you know, murderous tendencies separate her from the rest of humanity. And she thinks that after Kate and Tallulah both leave her, that she's just going to be alone forever. And then things start changing. Kate's brother Gideon comes into town and I'm obsessed with Gideon. He's a hockey player and he may have a little thing going on. Both of these books, five stars, five stars. I think I gave this like a 4.5 when I first read it, but I'll reread it. Five stars, it's so good. And Mayfly, obviously five stars. So just to get those out of the way, I did reread them both. So yeah, from here I'll be going in the order I read them. I just read boy parts first and I figured I might as well talk about Mayfly as well. The next book that I read was Sex and Rage by Eve Babbitts. I did like it, I wasn't obsessed. I have this book by Eve Babbitts. Um, I'll be right back. I have this nonfiction, like I think it's a collection of essays by Eve Babbitts. I've had it for ages, still have not read it to this day but she was apparently a big figure in the, I think the 70s? Yeah, like the 60s and 70s in LA. And she very much embodies that whole spirit. So I was interested in Sex and Rage for a long time because crazy title, first of all. And I was like, oh, it's the same woman that has, that wrote that book that I have and it's fiction, but it's also very much based on herself. <laughs> so it's kind of, I, I, what is the word for that? Like it's auto fiction, I think, when it's sort of an autobiography, but there's like fictional elements. It was interesting. It was really good vibes. There was simply not enough sex or rage for me. <laughs> I think when you have a title like that, it sets a certain kind of expectation. And she talks a lot about the sex and rage in different things. Like it'll be like in a work of art or in surfing or something like that. Like there's just sex and rage. It's kind of like, it's kind of like challengers where they're just like, oh, tennis is just like sex, you know? Which is apparent, like, I, I don't doubt it after seeing that film. It's about this girl, I forget her name. She has a crazy name. Oh, Jacaranda, her name's Jacaranda. And she 
just kind of like floats around. She grew up in LA, like loved to surf. And then she kind of like floats over to New York and she's a writer, so she writes these essays. And it kind of goes through like her relationship with the people that she meets in various places. Like she's very much in those artist circles. Like she's sort of a muse and she does her own things with writing. And like, she's around artists all the time. And my favorite thing about this book actually was that it makes a reference to like some guy having this photo that's actually of Eve Babbitt naked playing chess with this other famous guy. In the book, it's like this guy has it and he's like, oh, do you know this photo? And Jack O'Reilly is like, duh, everyone knows that photo. And I was like, girl, that is so slay. <laughs> like you really just wrote your own actual picture into the book and was like, everyone knows about it actually, cause I'm famous. <laughs> I think good vibes, but it just felt very like introspective, very wandery in a way that I usually like, but this time just didn't completely hit. But it was still good, like four stars. Next I read The Moonstone by Wilkie Collins. So I'm in this class, or I finished it now, but I was in this class called Victorian Materialities, which is all about the objects in Victorian novels because it was a very materialistic age. And The Moonstone is pretty much seen as like the first detective novel ever. I really liked it. It's about a moonstone. <laughs> the English had stolen from India and just kind of appropriated it as their own. So there's lots of conversations about colonialism kind of like wrapped up in these things. And everyone's like, oh my God, this stone is cursed because you took it from like a, a sacred place. And whoever has the stone, like bad things start to happen. And it's this very complicated story. There's lots of like different things going on. Basically there's like this country house in England, very like safe little home space. And then the guy, this, this girl, her uncle basically is the one that took the moonstone. And everyone was a little bit annoyed at him about it, but when he passed away, he gives it to his niece. Her cousin comes and gives it to her and then it goes missing the next day and they bring in like these detectives to work on it and all this stuff but it's almost like the detective is more of like he just comes and he's kind of incompetent but he helps a little bit and then another detective comes that's like smarter and also helps a little bit but the main guy solving it is the cousin that brought the moonstone does that make sense we talked a lot about that of how like the detective fiction genre obviously has changed a lot since then but like this book and Lady Audley's Secret which I'll talk about in a minute are both sort of early detective novels but the people actually doing the detective work are not police officers at all like they're just people involved in the case really interesting the writing was super atmospheric I would honestly really recommend it was it was quite good there were some POVs that I hated though because it's kind of like written as if it's a true story and then you get like different people being like i'm gonna write down what i thought when this happened and so yeah i don't know pretty good i gave it i gave it four stars then i read a really 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 good nonfiction, ejaculate responsibly by gabrielle stanley blair and it's just so good it's a tiny little book i read it on audio i think it was like maybe two hours on audiobook and it's just 21 arguments as to why we should be pro-choice and things having to do with birth control with condoms all sorts of different things it's all covered and it's succinct and like precise and I learned a lot actually <laughs> there's this one section that talks about what happens to women's bodies after they give birth wild wild like that messes you up for life and no one talks about it i just could not recommend this highly enough like it was so so well done then i read lady audley's secret by mary elizabeth braddon for that same class i was talking about and i love this book i think 4.5 stars i wrote my final essay on it basically this is a another sensation sort of like detective novel but it's about this woman named Lady Audley and she has a secret. <laughs> she is this super feminine kind of angelic figure, but it turns out she's actually lying to everyone all the time. 
and she's able to perform her femininity femininity in a way that's very manipulative and so she just gets what she wants especially from men and it's so interesting and i was able to use a lot of the same ideas that i talk about in my diss with this really old piece of literature and i thought that was really cool highly recommend if you're into victorian fiction honestly just so good i have discovered just how much i love victorian fiction from that module after that i read the new me by hallie butler on audio i was in the mood for a like unhinged woman type of vibe it was okay it was okay i really liked the writing this is basically about this girl and she works at this company that i what do they even do i don't know she's a receptionist okay and she's just sort of you know floating through life sort of like jack aranda and the other story like she is kind of aimless she just keeps getting these reception jobs and then there'll be like an opportunity for her to get properly hired and even though she's like super good at her job she never gets hired it talks about her starting this one specific job where like the woman that's kind of like her boss just hates her she hates her so much she hates like little things about her she's like oh she smells she can't staple things right and like little like very nitpicky things and the main girl let's call her anna she is just like obsessed with self-improvement and that's why it's called the new me because she's always trying to just improve herself but in a very like she'll be like oh i'm looking on my computer and at uh, sustainable water bottles and i think about how one day i'll be the kind of girl that uses them and i'll think about like how one day I'm gonna start doing yoga all the time and go to Pilates. And it's like, she'll say these things, but she'll never actually do them until one point in the book, she does sort of start that process. And it doesn't, the plot is not really plotting. <laughs> and I am usually such a character driven reader. So I typically don't mind it. But I think in the case of this and Sex and Rage, it was like the character stuff was a little bit too obtuse that I kind of, like there were no big moments where a character would really like let loose. I like the vibes. The vibes were immaculate, but it just kind of didn't really leave me satisfied. Um, 3.5 for that one. After that, I read Never Let Me Go by Kazuo Ishiguro on audiobook. And I am scared because there's people behind me. I'm gonna close that for a second. I get so nervous. And my window's open. They probably can hear this. No, I hate this. Let's keep it open. Never Let Me Go because you is your girl. It was a very famous book. I had really high expectations, especially because I read Remains of the Day by this author and loved it. It's about these people that went to this school that's very specific and there's lots of specific little rules and there's kind of a sinister thing going on in the background the whole time that's not fully revealed until like halfway through i would say but i actually got spoiled and i knew the thing before and i think the fact that i knew what the thing was i had certain expectations about the book i wanted it to go a little bit crazy and I didn't go crazy. Like there was, again, it was kind of like, okay, yeah, this is crazy. But like these, this is these people's like normal lives, which actually does make sense. And it's an interesting angle, but I was just kind of not that interested. So I gave it three stars. It wasn't horrible, just one and great. Next I read For My Diss, Story of the Eye by George Bataille. He is a French author. It was written in the 20s. It's a French pornographic novella that was so good. Basically, the reason why I read it is Maeve loves it. You can see there's a little eye on the cover. It's like she's obsessed with this book and it plays a big role in her character and in this novel. So I thought, hey, it's short. It's at my library. I'll read it and it'll be fun. And it was so fun. It, um, it's really crazy, okay? Let me just put that out there. It's not for the faint of heart, but at the same time, it's incredible. We usually associate erotica or pornographic books or even just genre fiction like horror 
or stuff like that as being sort of like lesser but the book is so literary it's actually crazy and there are two essays that they included at the back of the book that I read and really love. One is The Pornographic Imagination by Susan Sontag, which is actually a really underrated essay of hers, dare I say. I don't hear anyone talking about this. It was from the 60s and she basically argues for like the validity of pornographic fiction and also any fiction that deals with like really intense emotions and subject matter, which really relates to my disc, so I use that in there. And then there's one by Oh god, what's his name? Roland Barthes, um, about Story of the Eye specifically. What's really cool about the story is that apparently this was a thing that French authors sometimes did where there would be the story itself and then the part two was like an essay on why they wrote the story and like how the themes came about. Bataille talks about the trauma he went through as a child with his parents and goes into that and says like, I didn't realize when I started writing, but actually, the main symbols in the book are symbols of my past trauma and it's crazy. I wanted to read you guys a quote because the writing in this is just so good. Let me find one. I'll read you this section. It's like 10 pages in. I remember that one day when we were in a car tooling along at top speed, we crashed into a cyclist and apparently very young and very pretty girl. Her head was almost totally ripped off by the wheels. For a long time, we were parked a few yards beyond without getting out, fully absorbed in the sight of the corpse. The horror and despair at so much bloody flesh, nauseating in part and in part very beautiful, was fairly equivalent to our usual impression upon seeing one another. Simone was tall and lovely. She was usually very natural. There was nothing heartbreaking in her, her eyes or her voice. But on a sensual level, she so bluntly craved any upheaval that the faintest call from the senses gave her a look directly suggestive of all things linked to deep sexuality, such as blood, suffocation, sudden terror, crime, things indefinitely destroying human bliss and honesty. Come on. What? Yeah, I mean, obviously disturbing. There's there's lots of scenes that are quite taboo, but the writing is insane. And I'm just so interested in the concept of darkness being linked to sexuality. But that being something that's just kind of within all of us but we usually keep these things repressed which is sort of what i talk about in my disc but i've just been so interested in that lately and this book i can so see why cj lead was like inspired by it loved it 4.5 stars but i feel like on reread it could be a five don't know the next book i read was 100 years war on palestine by rashid khalidi it was really hard to read i read it on audio in terms of the conflict between israel and palestine i have been like woefully uneducated i'm from the states and i know that a lot of people in the states because of i think what we've been taught support israel but my little internet bubble and the area where i live a lot of people are supporting palestine and i I'm inclined to as well. It's horrible what's happening in Gaza. I just really felt like I wanted to fully know the history. So this book is really interesting because Khalidi is his family and sometimes him himself, he himself are very wrapped up in a lot of the events that have taken place over the co course of the war. They're an important family in Palestine and have often been like on boards or in meetings that were very very important so he provides a really good inside look and what i really liked about it was that it you know he's pal palestinian but he doesn't say hey we always behave perfectly and he doesn't like it, it doesn't feel biased even though he's like these are my people and they need help he gives the facts and it, I was blown away. It was really hard to listen to. A lot to take in as well, just like very dense, but really worth it when I finished um, and just really, really impactful. So highly recommend if you want to learn more about what's going on with the whole Israel-Palestine conflict. Hi, I'm editing. I just wanted to come on here and say that I've included in the description below a link to the UN crisis relief where you can donate to help the Palestinian people. The donation goes, I'm reading this off the website, to the Occupy Palestinian Territory Humanitarian 
fun, which is one of the quickest and the most effective ways to provide urgent support like on the ground. I just wanted to make that resource available if you would like to donate. Even if not, I would encourage you to share. It's um, insane what's happening right now and heartbreaking and people helping in even a little way would go a long way. Just wanted to note that that is down there. I am not the person to speak on what's happening. I am white. I just read a book and I don't now know everything about it. I would encourage you to look into learning more about what's happening if possible because I think it's important. On a completely lighter, different note, I read Howl's Moving Castle by Diana Wynne-Jones. I watched the film I think a couple months ago and I liked it but I didn't love it which is a bit weird to say. I know I'm unpopular in that probably. I don't even know what I thought was missing. I probably should rewatch it. I wanted to read the book just to see how it was different because I heard that they were really different and I might have liked the book better but I think I would have to rewatch the film to really know. If you don't know this is the story of Sophie who is a hat maker like her dad was a hat maker they own a hat shop and she has these two sisters and a stepmother and then her dad dies. Her stepmom sends her sisters away to like do different things, but she keeps Sophie at the hat shop. And one thing that's so funny throughout the whole book is like, oh, being an eldest child is just the worst. It's just the worst. And she was like, I have no prospects because I'm the eldest child. And I was like, pardon? Is this like something that we all know? <laughs> I'm the eldest girl and I feel like the eldest child. So maybe that means I have no hope, <laughs> no hope in life. But then this witch comes and this is like very much like the movie, like the witch comes and she curses Sophie and Sophie turns into an old lady. So she leaves the hat shop and she's going out of the town and then she sees this castle that's moving and everyone knows about how he is like a, you know, wicked wizard. Ah! You know, he's horrible, bad news. And they know that he has this moving castle that will like move around and basically freak people out because sometimes it'll be like really far away. And then other times just like right above the village and everyone's like, oh my God, he's nearby. But Sophie's like, I need a place to sleep and I kind of have nothing to lose. So she kind of hitchhikes her way onto the castle. And from there, it's all very found family, a lot of really quirky kind of cute characters and things that happen. And I did, I really enjoyed it. The one thing is like, Sophie and Hal, spoiler alert, skip if you don't want spoilers, maybe 30 seconds. Sophie and Hal get together at the end, but in both the book and the movie, I didn't feel like the buildup was really there. So that's always a little bit frustrating because I don't mind romance, but it's just, it has to be included in the right way for me. I gave it four stars. I really liked it. Next, I read What My Bones Know by Stephanie Fu. This is a memoir that I've heard so many people say good things about it, about. So I picked it up on audio and I loved it. Stephanie Fu writes a very deep, very introspective memoir about how she was diagnosed with CPSD. Yeah, CPSD, which is complex PTSD, which is basically just worse than normal PTSD because it's like a lot more intense and hard to deal with. Um, let me see if I can find a definition. According to Medical News Today, complex post-traumatic stress disorder is closely related to traditional PTSD, but may have additional symptoms. It can happen if a person experiences repeated trauma over a long period of time. Yeah, okay, that's what it is. So it's like, because whatever the trauma is happened repeatedly for a long time, usually like years, it's typically associated with like, you know, childhood abuse and stuff like that. So it's really hard to deal with. And it's very like multi-layered and complex, which is why it's called complex PTSD. <laughs> Stephanie talks about how her life as a child was really rough and how it still um, impacts her today. And her journey kind of trying to figure out therapy and treatment options. And she talks about The Body Keeps the Score, which is by this guy that I did not know this, but he apparently has some abuse allegations himself now. But she works kind of closely with that book, which is a book I've read and really found useful for myself. I find it so interesting, like the intertextuality there between the two. The coolest part is she starts seeing a therapist and she asks him 
if she can record their sessions. And in the audiobook, you get the actual audio recordings of their sessions. And it's crazy. It's so good. And the therapist she works with is just amazing. It's a very hard listen at times, but it's just amazing. Really, oh, just incredible. Just, just incredible. I felt really seen in a way that I, I don't experience very often. Even though I don't have CPSD, I do have PTSD. And I've struggled with my mental health for a long time and been kind of in this whole, you know, going to therapy, trying different things sort of world for years. So yeah, I, I just felt really seen and I really, really loved it. Next we have Sundial by Katrina Ward, which I picked up kind of really randomly on audio and I loved it. I've heard a lot of people say that they don't really like this. Not really sure why, because I had a great time. It was scary, it was fun, it was disturbing, and overall just really like thought provoking, which was cool. So this is a book, it's horror. It's about this woman and she has two daughters and she's married to this guy, right? I can't remember her name but we'll just call her mom. She's just the mom, right? So she has these two daughters, um, K Katie? Katie? Oh, Callie and Annie. And I was like, oh, that's me. I just freak out whenever I see my name in anything. But there are always like weird characters. Like, you know, the mom in Hereditary, her name is Annie. And I'm like, okay. Where's the representation <laughs> for other Annie? <laughs> anyway, that is so, that's so besides the point. The mom, she is really unhappy in her relationship with the dad who just sucks. Honestly, he's the worst. He's always cheating and he makes her feel like shit. And he's like, oh, you can never leave me because I know something about you that you don't want to get out. And she's like, okay, well, I guess we're stuck together. But also if you're cheating all the time, like why do you even want to be with me type of thing? So it's like, it's a lot. And basically Annie is the younger child and she and her mom have this like really special connection. Like the mom, she loves Annie and Callie is her second favorite, which is rough, but Callie's really close to the dad and he kind of feeds her all this stuff about the mom, right? And we don't really know how much of what he says is true. We don't know if we're really getting the full picture on any of these characters. One day the mom goes into Callie's room, which she's noticed has had a weird smell, which is always a bad sign in a horror. Come on, like that is so concerning. And she goes in and she finds all these, basically just like a piece of paper with a drawing of an animal. And then the skeleton of the animal is like glued on top to like where everything would be. And the mom has been finding some dead animals around the house lately and she's like, oh my God, Callie has been killing these animals. Also massive for this book, maybe this is why a lot of people don't like it. So much animal cruelty and abuse, you cannot get around it. Like if you don't wanna see that in a book, if that's really upsetting to you, do not read this book, don't even touch it. Like it's, it's not even just a couple scenes, it's all throughout. That's probably actually why a lot of people don't like it. I've heard a lot of people say that they don't really like this. Not really sure why. Not really sure why. It was hard to read about. Um, yeah. Anyway, the mom freaks out and she's like, Callie, you're gonna have to come with me to Sundial. And Sundial is her family's old home where she grew up and it was sort of almost like a commune, but like just them. They had this really strange way of life there and she still owns the house, but no one really lives there anymore. Her mom and dad's and her sister's graves are all there. The mom takes Kelly to Sundial and she's like, I'm worried about you. And I've seen things like what you are doing before. And let me tell you about my past. And so we start hearing about that. Another thing about Kelly is that she has all these imaginary friends that tell her to do all sorts of weird things. So there's a lot going on. And it it was crazy. It was crazy. Like before I had been getting a lot of these books where I was like, I really wanted it to be crazy. And it wasn't like, this was insane. It was insane. And I loved it. Like it was really fucked up. It um definitely very fucked up book, disturbing, like just hard to read at times, but I loved it. 
I want to read more horror. Like, I'm, I'm getting so into it. I love watching horror films, so I want to continue with these. But if you are interested, I would really recommend this book. Although, please look up other trigger warnings as well, because there's probably a ton I didn't mention. I read Praise by Sarah Kate on KU. And this was weird for me. I never read books like this. This is a forbidden romance. It's about this girl, I forget her name. We'll call her like Julie, okay? And Julie used to go out with this bag, shit bag, horrible guy. They broke up and he like cheated on her all the time and he made her feel like shit. They had like some sort of bill that they both shared and then she had to get like half the money back from him. I don't remember really what it was, but she has to go to his house to get the money. But then he's like, I don't want to see you. My dad has the money, so go see my dad. And she meets the dad. And what happens is like, she walks in the room and he's like a wealthy businessman. And he owns like this club called the Salacious Players Club, which I'm sorry, that's a little bit of a creepy name. I don't love the word salacious. <laughs> it reminds me of like people just drooling. Anyway, he owns a, a sex club. She walks into his office and he's like, why aren't you kneeling? And she's like, what? And he's like, why aren't you kneeling? And she's like, oh, okay. So she kneels and then he's like, why are you here? He thinks that she's there to be his like secretary sex slave, basically. She tells him why she's here. And then he's like, oh my God, stand up. No, uh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry you had to see. Uh, hi, I'm what's his name Wes I'm Wes's dad I pardon and then she gets the job anyway and then they become romantically linked and it's all very taboo because it's like oh my god I went out with your son something about it kind of worked for me I like an age gap that's like it doesn't feel creepy and this one didn't overall liked it more than I thought I would the writing was a little bit uh, but it wasn't the worst and I could see a lot of people really liking this. I saw this on TikTok, which is why I picked it up. But honestly, I was really only reading it for the sex scenes. I was not reading it for the plot. <laughs> and so I, I really just didn't care about, you know, like the third up breakup and all this stuff. I was just reading it for the sex. And I have to be so honest about that. I can see why a lot of people would like it in terms of like actually the themes, like she becomes a lot more confident and begins to accept herself. And he um, uncovers like a deeper, sort of more sensitive side of him, which is nice. Yeah, I gave it three stars. I was just, I read it for one reason and one reason only. And there wasn't as much of that in there as I was kind of hoping that there would be, but it was still nice. It was still fun. Lastly, I read Ace of Spades by Farida Abike Imede. I, I don't think I said that right. I apologize, Miss Farida, because I love you and I love your books. Wow, wow. I had heard everyone talking about Ace of Spades for ages, obviously. The way that even the author describes it is Gossip Girl meets Get Out, but gay. And it was so gay and it was so good. It was so good. If you don't know what this is about, it's about these two people. There's Chiamanda and Devon, and they're the only two black students at this fancy private school. Chiamanda is like the it girl actually at this school. She is so Blair Waldorf coded, like she is mean. She has like this underclassman bringing her coffees just unprompted every day. <laughs> She's just kind of a stone cold bitch and she's like, she says sort of in the beginning, she's like, I dated this guy because I knew that he would get me into this circle. And then I dated this guy because I knew that everyone else wanted to date him and I just wanted to be that girl. She's calculated. She's like, everyone's playing the game, like this social game, and I just play it the best. So I'm winning. And Devon is like, he's very quiet. He's a scholarship student. He just wants to make music and go to Juilliard. And he has this teacher that really believes in him and gives him studio time all the time. And he is really good at doing music. And then this person called Aces starts releasing Gossip Girl-esque texts to everyone. They're revealing really, really personal things about Chiamanda and Devon. And it's literally only about them. Like sometimes other people will be sort of like collateral damage, but very rarely. And it's deep, 
personal things. So you're constantly trying to figure out who Aces is. You feel like you can't trust anyone. And what I loved was like, well, there was so much I loved about it, but what was really cool was that I would think I knew what was going on. And then like five pages later, it would be like, I actually had no clue. I had no idea. Um, And it's crazy. It was so good. And the message was really important and incredible. It almost reminds me of Tracy Dion, like Legendborn. I just think like those two, these two authors write about race in young adult fiction in a way that is really impactful and really well done. Um, I mean, I am white, so who am I to say, but I I really appreciated their viewpoints. I'm just excited because this author that did Ace of Spades is coming out with a new book. Actually, it's already out and it's called Where Sleeping Girls Lie. And I don't even know what it's about, but I love this so much. I just can't wait to read the new book. So I have a hold on it on audio at my library. Also the audiobook of Ace of Spades, by the way, is amazing. The casting for the voices of Devon and Chimanda was incredible. And I actually listened to an interview with uh, Farida Abike Imede. Uh, still don't think I said it right, but um, she was talking about how she was actually really involved in the audiobook production, which is something that doesn't always happen for authors, but she was super involved in the casting and stuff, which was really, really cool. So I loved it. All right. So those are all the books I read in March and April. I overall actually really liked a lot of the things I read. I don't think there were any, anything below a three star, but I was DNFing like nobody's business. Like I have been DNFing a lot more and I'm really happy that I am actually because I'm, I just don't want to read books I don't like. <laughs> if you like this video, please give it a like. Consider prescribing prescribe <laughs> consider subscribing if you haven't perhaps i really want to get back to posting regularly it was my goal before and i think it still will be to try to post once a week especially now that i have a bit more time over the summer so i'm excited about new videos and stuff as always let me know what you think about any of the books i've read or if you read any books that you loved or hated during the past couple months i want to hear about it if you have any videos specifically that you'd like to see from me let me know i hope you're doing well and i'll see you in my next video bye